Good afternoon. Afternoon, everybody. If you're, if you're getting food, please keep go, uh, get your food. We want everybody to be uh, well fed. Um, so your stomach will be satisfied and your mind will be too. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to the uh, Cato Institute Capitol Hill briefing, uh, Realistic Solutions to Big College Problems, Overhauling the Higher Education Act. Uh, I want to welcome everyone, of course, who's here, actually, in the room, uh, everybody who's watching online and following on Twitter. And if you want to tweet a question or a comment or something like that, please use hashtag Cato CEF, that's C-A-T-O-C-E-F. Uh, my name is Neil McCluskey, and I'm the director of the Center for Educational Freedom uh, at the Cato Institute. Now, it's my job today to moderate the discussion, uh, including of three terrific new higher education books, and their authors and editors are here. Uh, but first, it is my great pleasure to introduce Senator Rick Scott of Florida, who has a really keen interest in higher education, perhaps from what you did and you learned as governor of uh, the state of Florida. Uh, he's been thinking very hard about what needs to be done to sort of get the ivory tower to start, uh, you know, get it back upright, make it pay its bills, maybe make those bills a little smaller because it's been quite a drain often on taxpayers and students. And he's been thinking a lot about how do we fix that problem. Uh, just a little background on Senator Scott. He was elected to the Senate in 2018. He's currently serving his first term. Prior to that, he served two terms as the 45th governor of the state of Florida. He joined the Navy before that, where he served active duty as a radar man uh, aboard the USS Glover. Uh, he used the GI Bill to attend the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and is also a graduate of the Southern Methodist University Dedman School of Law. Uh, as governor, he did a great deal of work on K-12 and higher education issues, including vetoing a 3% tuition increase. All students here will appreciate the vetoing of a tuition increase, I'm sure. Uh, that was recommended by the legislature in 2013. He restored the top and second level awards in the state's merit-based Bright Future Scholarship Program. Also, if you're a student, you probably appreciate that. Uh, and he signed a budget authorizing $80 million to reward colleges and universities that graduated students who were best positioned to get a job, which seems like a big mission of higher education. I'd also like to say, as an observer of K-12 through and higher education, Florida often seems to me like a really ideal place to be, not just because of the weather. And if I can get Cato to move its headquarters there, my already sky-high job satisfaction would go up just a little bit higher. And with that, Senator Scott, the podium is yours. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon, I guess. It's just past noon. Before we start, there is a... Uh, a beer contest tonight uh, with uh, Anheuser-Busch. If you get on our Twitter page, you can vote for our beer. Uh, there's like eight uh, senators and congressmen and women that uh, did different beers from across the country, and I'd like to win. So <laughs> how many of you want to be in second place? I don't think any of us do. So thank, I want to thank you for having me here, and thank you for caring so much about uh, higher education. Students across the country are heading back to school. So there's no better time to talk about our education system and how important it is to keep education affordable and attainable for every American student. Now you should be shocked. What do you think it cost when I went to, uh, I, went to I started junior college because university was expensive. What did it cost a semester when I went to school? 200. You could take 21 hours. It was 200, the universities were 255, and so as many of us could do, went, we all would try to go to, the, uh, think, uh, to junior college first and then go to the university because that was too expensive. Today, the average cost of a private four-year college is more than $32,000 per year. The average cost of a public four-year college for out-of-state students is almost $24,000 per year, and the average cost of a public four-year college for in-state students is almost $10,000 per year. That's crazy. If you look at where, what it was when I went to school as compared to what it is now. The cost of a four-year degree has increased eight times more than the increase in wages. Remember what was supposed to happen is you went to school because you made more money. Well, wages are going up way slower than, than, uh, than the, the uh, tuition is. Total student loan debt in the United States now stands at more than $1.5 trillion. The delinquency or default rate is over 11%. Now the Democrats have a great new solution. It's, it's really great. Their plan is just make it all disappear. <laughs> Poof, just like that. Cancel all student loan debt. It's going to be magic. 
But of course, canceling loon, student loan debt is not going to solve it's not going to solve the problem of the cost of education. Over the last six years of my term as governor, we held the line on tuition. And when I went in, they were raising tuition in my state at the universities at 15 percent plus inflation annually. Annually. And they had sold this, that they should keep doing this. So we held the line on tuition for six straight years. We implemented performance funding in our colleges and universities. And the performance funding amount for universities is five, was, when I left, $580 million per year. And 11 of our schools were, were, could get it. Three didn't get it, and eight shared the, shared, shared the $580 million. So it was a big deal. Uh, we in, and on top of that, we invested a lot of money in career and technical training. So these are pretty simple concepts. It's about creating incentives to make sure all of our higher education institutions were doing their, their most important job. And what's that? Is prepare students for an opportunity to get a good job. When I went to school, what did I think about? What's it cost me? Do I get a job? How much money do I make? The results speak for themselves. For three years in a row, U.S. News & World Report has ranked Florida's higher education system as the best in the nation. Not second, the best. As I tell my good friend Rick Perry, every time I have a chance. <laughs> we have the second lowest state university tuition in the nation. When I became governor, Rick Perry had been governor for six years, and so all I did was I competed with him on everything I could. <laughs> Politicians in Washington and around the country too often fail to understand the importance of keeping the cost down for higher education. They just want to get, give out government money tied to no results. But it's not fair to us as taxpayers. It's actually not fair to the students. So I'm working on a series of bills right now that I'll be filing soon. That is, the plan is we will drive down the cost of higher education and ensure students are prepared to get a good job. First, if a student defaults on their federal loan, the institution where they took classes, took classes should be responsible for a portion of their default. They should have skin in the game. By forcing universities to take more responsibility, they'll have more of an incentive to actually prepare students for careers. Second, there should be the exact same rules whether you're a for-profit school or not-for-profit schools. There shouldn't be different rules because in whether, what, whatever type of school you go to, the goal is affordable education and a job at the end. Third, if a college or university raises tuition or fees, they will be automatically cut off from all federal funding, including federally guaranteed loan programs. I used, to, I used to be in a variety of businesses. One was manufacturing. In manufacturing, the expectation was that we reduced our costs constantly. We had to figure out how to be more productive. We have to expect the same thing out of our schools. All federal funding will be cut off if tuition or fees are increased. Pell Grants. You should be able to use Pell Grants for techni technical colleges. So if you decide you want to go to a technical school instead of to a four-year school, why can't you use your Pell Grant for that? Many times, the better, the better paying job is, in, is out of a technical school. Finally, we've got to reverse the Obama-era policies that hinder private lenders from giving loans. It shouldn't be just tied to the federal government uh, doing the loans. We should let the private sector um, do the loans. So these are a few of the ideas, um, and we're, we're talking to a lot of individuals about other ideas, but my whole goal is how do you drive down the cost of getting a degree, and how do you make sure when, when a student finishes, they have a good paying job? The Democrats are proposing policy plans that will bankrupt and destroy our country just to win a presidential primary. Hopeful parents and grandparents absolutely deserve better. I mean, if you think, if you think about, like I grew up in a very poor family. I don't know my dad. We lived in public housing. I had a very tough mom. Uh, she said, you're gonna, get, you're gonna go to church all the time. You're gonna be an Eagle Scout. You're gonna make straight A's and go get a job. And she was absolutely committed that I would get a good education because she believed there was a good paying job at the end. Otherwise, why would we be doing it? So parents and grandparents, that's how they think. Uh, we all want our family to do well. Uh, so, so if you think about it, as students, the parents and grandparents, they deserve a serious discussion about how we can make this a better place. And um, we are able to do it in Florida. There is, there is no reason we can't do, do this. There's no reason we can't figure out how to do this less expensively. There's no reason we can't figure out how to make sure this is more accountable to the student getting a job at the end. That's the whole purpose of this. If you want to go, if you want to go get a degree and you know there's no ability to get a job at the end, that's great. But the federal taxpayers should not be on the hook for that. That's not fair to the federal taxpayers. So thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to working with you. If you have any ideas, uh, Paul Bonicelli, my office, uh, does all my education policy. You can call me or call Paul. We are, we are going to do everything we can uh, to improve higher education in the country. And thanks again for Cato for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thanks. All right, see you.
Thank you, Senator. Um, so now it is my great pleasure to introduce our panelists. But first, I just want to lay out some um, ground rules for how we're going to do question and answer, because this is all going to be question and answer, and I hope it's going to be very interactive. Now, any of you who've gone to uh, an event like this in Washington, you've probably heard people say, uh, please just ask a question, don't give a statement, and then you know everybody proceeds to make statements. Um, and so I've given up on that whole ruse of being like, oh yeah, just ask a question. So I want you to listen to the panelists, I'm gonna ask some questions, they're gonna give me answers, I may make some comments, and then when we get to audience Q&A, if you have a statement you wanna make, and you keep it short, so don't filibuster, I know that you're on Capitol Hill, you're like, oh, I should be able to filibuster all I want. <laughs> if you keep it short and you have a comment and you're, you, know, you keep it civil, I'm not going to stop you. And if you want to respond to a panelist, if you want to respond to someone else who said something in the audience, that is fine by me. And also, if you are following uh, on Twitter, you know, you're, you're not in here with us and you want to ask a question or make a comment, put in hashtag CatoCEF and I'm going to monitor that. And if it's an angry Twitter comment, I'll act angry when I ask you the question. So just uh, indicate, I'm really not happy. Please yell at these guys. Um, so that's just to get us sort of started. If, unfortunately, if you're on Twitter, you can't really filibuster in 280 characters. So that's a tough break. Anyway, so now I'll introduce our panelists. And then I've got some questions for them. And after that, I'm going to open up to you all because I think it's your questions that will be far more interesting than mine. So the first uh, person we have is right here on my left, although I'm going to kind of go out of order, but Phil Magnus, who is the co-author with Jason Brennan of this book, Cracks in the Ivory Tower, The Moral Mess of Higher Education. I have a lot of books to hold up, and I may end up dropping some, so prepare yourselves. Phil uh, is a policy historian, the author of numerous works on economic history, taxation, uh, economic inequality, the history of slavery, and education policy in the United States. His historical writings have appeared in numerous academic journals, which may or may not be a good thing. We'll probably talk about what's the value of an academic journal, but anyway. Um, but he's also written for popular outlets, uh, including the New York Times and Daily Caller. Uh, we also, it turns out, overlapped as PhD students at George Mason University School of Public Policy, now called the Shar School, which may or may not reflect neoliberal efforts to commoditize higher education. <laughs> Am I right about that, Phil? Exactly. Okay, good. All right, next, actually at the far end, uh, is Richard Vedder. He is the author of Restoring the Promise, Higher Education America, as well as a chapter in Unprofitable Schooling, examining causes of and fixes for America's Broken Ivory Tower, which I'll discuss a little bit more in a minute. Uh, professor Vetter is the Distinguished Professor of Economics at Ohio University, a visiting, fellow, or a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, and a senior fellow at the Independent Institute. Uh, Vetter also served on the Secretary of Education's Commission on the Future of Higher Education, and is the author of Going Broke by Degree, Why College Costs Too Much. Uh, Professor Vetter earned his bachelor's degree in economics in 1962 from Northwest University and his PhD in economics from the University of Illinois in 1965. Professor Vetter has written over 100 scholarly papers published in academic journals and books, and his work has also appeared in numerous newspapers and magazines, including the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and USA Today. In other words, you can hear all that and you know that Dr. Vetter has made quite a career out of this whole higher education racket. Um, <laughs> finally, we have... <laughs> Finally, we have Todd Zwicky. He's actually in the middle, but I put him on last. Uh, it's alphabetical, I guess. Um, he is co-editor of Unprofitable Schooling, examining causes of and fixes for America's broken ivory tower. And he's really the senior partner in this co-editing process, having come up with the whole idea for the book and commissioned all the chapters before bringing it to some clown co-editor, that'd be me, uh, to help in all the hard work of actually putting the book together was complete. Uh, Zwicky is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, and he is the George Mason University Foundation Professor of Law at the Antonin Scalia School of Law, among many positions and titles that he holds. Uh, he also is the author of more than 70 articles uh, in leading law reviews and peer-reviewed economic journals. He received his JD from the University of Virginia, an MA in economics from Clemson University, and an AB cum laude with high honors in his major from Dartmouth College. And by the way, it is Todd's relationship with the latter, Dartmouth, that may be his biggest claim to fame. Uh, in the mid-2000s, he staged kind of a coup, 
a coup of sorts, to get on the school's board of trustees, much to the consternation of the status quo. Uh, and he, uh, I guess he's sort of decided, I'm not just going one school at a time now, I'm going to take down academia in its entirety. Uh, and so that is what brings us to this book. And so I now thank you all for joining us. And my first question to all of you, and you can answer in whatever order you want, what was the impetus for you putting together the books that you did? Phil, you want to go first? So uh, basically the background of this book is it came out of a uh, response to... Oh, there we go. Yeah, so the background of this book is it came out of a response to the higher ed press and the way that uh, universities are uh, basically talked about in the news. Uh, so my co-author and I, Jay Brennan, uh, we were reading the Chronicle of Higher Education, Inside Higher Ed, all the uh, the standard go-to places for news about the academy, and we discovered uh, basically two patterns played out. First off, uh, a lot of the arguments that appear in analyzing very real problems and also some imaginary problems about higher ed are uh, detached from empirical evidence, detached from uh, what the stats were actually saying. And the second thing that comes up uh, over and over again, whenever uh, academics start to diagnose problems within their own uh, uh, environment, within their own industry, uh, they tend to blame some really far-fetched uh, explanations on this. So, for example, we all know that tuition is rising out of control. We all know that administrative bloat is, uh, is basically uh, an unrestrained area of growth in the university system. It's, uh, it's gone up by uh, fourfold over the past 30 years. We all know that uh, universities are not delivering on some of the promises that they happen to uh, offer in their marketing material. But the explanations that were being offered for some of these problems that are, are noticed and very real as uh, uh, they fall into a category of what we, we term poltergeist explanations. Uh, so a poltergeist is a, uh, um, a ghostly entity that tears up your house, throws things out of the cabinets in the kitchen, uh, but poltergeists are not real is the, uh, the key takeaway there. So for example, uh, a, uh, an administrative bloat argument would be blamed on something like the corporatization of the university or neoliberalism, these abstract concepts that don't really seem to have any empirical connection to the diagnosis that was being offered. So Jay and I started looking at some of the stats and we started coming up with alternative explanations that are rooted in really human behavior, institutional incentives, uh, people that are acting in a very rational way in the university system, and not for any uh, malicious reason, but rather that are pursuing their own self-interest. This can include everyone from uh, the high-end administrator, the president of a university, down to the faculty, to the students themselves. They all want to get something very rational out of higher education. And if you follow those premises to their conclusion, you get a, a, a much uh, more nuanced explanation of some of the problems that emerge from the uh, higher ed system. Rich, you guys can... Go ahead. I think Rich was first. Well, what do you do? Okay. I'm teaching a course in American economic history this fall. I taught the same course 54 years ago. This is my 55th year in a row of teaching this course. Uh, I teach it the same way as I did then. I teach it the same way as Socrates would have taught it if he had the historical perspective to do it. Uh, with the possible exception of prostitution, I know of no profession that has had absolutely no productivity advance in the 2,400 years <laughs> since Socrates taught the youth of Athens. Uh, when I started the teaching of this little course of mine, uh, the tuition was $450 a year. In today's dollars, using the CPI, which probably overstates the inflation, actually, it would be, let's be charitable and say $3,600 a year in today's dollars at my university. It is, in fact, more than $12,000 or to over triple that. When I started teaching, for every faculty member, there was, let me use what I call West Virginia PowerPoint, my fingers, <laughs> uh, about one half of an administrator. For every two faculty, there was one person doing administrative chores, the registrar's office, the librarians, etc. Now there are more administrators than faculty. So I've seen all this happen over the years. So I went 35 years happily 
deriving economic rents from all of this system and enjoying it. And then I started feeling guilty as I was getting at uh, retirement age and I could say any damn thing I want, not that I couldn't before, but now I could really say anything. <laughs> so I started writing books about it, which I have continued to do as I approach my dotage. So that's <laughs> what brings me here. Um, well, thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, um, so this book uh, actually kind of had the genesis and what Neil responded, uh, referred to, which was this unusual experience I had about 15 years ago of getting elected to the Dartmouth Board of Trustees as a write-in candidate um, and uh, as part of a kind of a movement uh, of, uh, of engaged alumni to try to um, straighten out the college, um, at which point... Um, they uh, metaphorically uh, rolled the tanks into Tiananmen Square and basically, uh, uh, you know, kicked us off uh, eventually and watered us down. So, I, and so I was interested in the governance issues of higher ed, right? Which is that everybody knows higher ed is broken. It costs too much. It delivers too little. Um, that the curriculum's a joke. Uh, yet the problems keep getting worse and worse and worse, even though uh, people seem, you know, the need for reform seems fairly obvious to most people. And so I, together with uh, the great Henry Manny, um, who had been a, a law school administrator, had been dean of law school, we were both interested in why is it that things keep getting worse? And, the, and we discovered that one issue that, th that no serious work had really been written on was the governance issues in higher education, right? Which is who owns the university, how they run it, uh, and essentially the rise of the faculty-governed university, which um, I think everybody on this table kind of would be in agreement, basically means the faculty get to run the university for themselves, uh, and um, students are an afterthought. And, uh, uh, but, uh, and over time, this growth of sort of shared um, rent-seeking with administrators, right? Um, and so, uh, uh, and, you know, all the, and the other things going on. So what we were particularly interested in was thinking about governance, um, about, and different business models, um, and, uh, um, and how those had changed over time, right? And so, and at the same time, one of the things that was going on was this kind of bizarre war on for-profit colleges and the whole idea that some others, something fundamentally wrong with uh, private enterprise in this industry when private enterprise has been a miracle in every other industry, right? Uh, and there's very good reasons why you might have different governance ownership structures uh, competing against each other in various industries, right? Keep in mind, this was before we even found out that Michigan State was, uh, you know, the nonprofit uh, was basically running a human rights abuse out of their gymnastics program, or that Penn State was basically operating a pedophile ring, or Duke, uh, who had to give back, what, $100 million in uh, phony research grants, right? Uh, and that was even before we found out that basically the nonprofit universities were selling admission slots uh, to uh, to celebrity kids, uh, basically because they would give a lot of money, right? That's the nonprofit uh, side, <laughs> uh, and that's just what we know about, right? Uh, and yet, at the same time, there was this sort of obsession with that's the proper governance model for uh, for universities. It's just kind of bizarre to think that 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 that's the only way we can run it, right? And the idea that whenever a for-profit college would do something wrong, well, that shows the whole sector is flawed, right? But nobody says that when Michigan State uh, or Penn State comes to light. They don't say, well, obviously, you know, that's what all those guys do, right? Um, so anyway, so, so that was what we were interested in. What we were particularly interested in was thinking about how can we use competition and consumer choice in this market to bring the benefits and the virtues of competition consumer uh, choice that we see in every other sector of the economy that has transformed uh, you know, the, <clears throat> every other sector of the economy with lower prices, higher quality, more uh, sa consumer satisfaction and the like. And so we started off by basically looking at what did the world look like? First part of the book where uh, Rich's uh, uh, great essay occurs is what did the world look like before we had sort of comprehensive 
government intervention in the in the uh, in this sector of the economy, right? And what we find is back during the 19th century, for example, there was a very thriving market for higher education. Um, the idea that we need huge subsidies for people to invest in uh, human capital investments, like to become more productive, it's a pretty dubious proposition on the front end. But when you look historically, there are plenty of schools of engineering and medicine and law and all those sorts of uh, sorts of things. Rich contributes a chapter on the Morrill Act and sort of the lack of impact of uh, the first uh, Morrill Act. The second section of the book then talks about where we are today, where this mess came from. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in here. But obviously, uh, government financing is the big one here, right, which is the estimates are maybe two, uh, uh, two-thirds of every dollar um, of uh, federal financial support gets passed through and higher costs uh, to, to students. So sort of driving that side of the equation. I've got a chapter that talks about the, uh, the growth of administration and administrative bloat uh, and that driving factors. Particularly commend those who are interested. There's a great uh, uh, contribution by, um, by Josh Hall on accreditation. Uh, and accreditation is really the big, uh, uh, the big problem now in terms of, of, um, of preventing competition and consumer choice uh, in higher education. And ironically, it goes back to the beginning of the story, as Josh points out, the accreditation stranglehold and uh, um, uh, monopoly basically came about as an unintended consequence of the first GI Bill. Uh, and once people were no longer spending their own money, you had the problem of sort of diploma mills springing up. Uh, and so they had to figure out what was a real college from what wasn't, and they grabbed a hold of accreditation, and now accreditation's basically come the tail that wags the dog. Final section of the book uh, basically talks about how we might be able to use competition and consumer choice to uh, um, create innovation in, uh, in this market, looking particularly at why, did, why do students choose for-profit colleges, uh, for example, um, as opposed to community colleges, um, and uh, various, uh, various other uh, aspects of the market today and, uh, and going forward. Um, and so it's kind of a comprehensive look at the question of uh, uh, of, of uh, how can we use competition to consumer choice and this sort of mindset that's kind of developed that there's only one model for higher education and how uh, these entities should be operated, which is particularly co peculiar considering that model seems to be pretty um, severely broken. So what do you all think, um, I'll frame this two ways because they could be different things. One is, what do you think is sort of the most pressing problem in higher education? If there's one thing that we've got to stop or try and slow down right now, what is that? And then the other question is, and maybe these are different things, what do you think is maybe the root problem or the biggest problem in higher education or one that underlies lots of the other things we see? Mr. I think the, uh, the biggest uh, issue in higher education right now is probably the out-of-control cost. I mean, uh, student tuition uh, is skyrocketing ac across the country. We see evidence of this in uh, almost every single state. Uh, we also see student loans are, uh, you know, they've emerged as a major uh, public policy discussion, including loans that are subsidized by federal, state, and local governments. Um, on top of that, the cost of actually delivering the product of higher ed seems to be going through the roof. So one of the things that we discuss in our book are uh, the expansion of frivolous expenses around higher ed. And you think about this, go back to uh, when you toured your college, when you uh, arrived uh, basically trying to make a decision, do I want to go here, where do they take you? It's the campus rec center where they've got the rock climbing wall, or now some uh, schools are building lazy rivers, uh, like uh, water parks and stuff on campus, public universities, that they take you to uh, amenities and facilities where they're going to have the concert venue or the nice hotel-style dorm, uh, all sorts of frivolous uh, extensions of what the university is offering. What they don't do, generally, is walk you into the, uh, uh, the stuffy classroom in the basement of the science building. Uh, they don't walk you into uh, um, areas of the university that are connected to the core of the educational uh, function of being there to supply the degree. They'll, they'll take you to the football stadium or the new athletic center, uh, showing off very expensive high-end amenities that are connected to uh, budgetary growth in the university. Uh, so you ask the question of what's driving this. Well, there's a, uh, a very concentrated benefit associated with each of these uh, expenditures for uh, maybe a small group of students that want the rock climbing wall and the administrators that actually run the thing, but the cost of it, they're diffused onto everyone. 
They, they're spread into your tuition. They're spread into fees that are tacked on to uh, getting a college degree. And you see the story playing out over and over and over again in university administrative growth. Uh, we have offices that are springing up today that didn't even exist 20 or 30 years ago. So uh, how many campuses have a, uh, an Office of Environmental Sustainability today? They're all over the place. 20 or 30 years ago, they didn't have that. And you may say, maybe it's nice that we should be uh, saving the environment or uh, cutting our carbon footprint or whatever. But what these, uh, these offices end up doing is consuming vast amounts of resources that are passed on to students in terms of tuition. Uh, so we ask the question, what is higher ed providing here? Is it really a degree? Is it really a, an education? Or is it a jobs program for administrators? Is it a jobs program for faculty in areas of the university that are, uh, are, are declining or not able to attract uh, uh, majors? And uh, are the costs of, uh, of sustaining this entire operation being felt by anyone other than the students and the taxpayers themselves? And I'd even argue that uh, there's a moral issue to this. So uh, you're a student, you're 18 or 19 years old, you're going off to college for the first time. You're probably in a weaker financial position yourself than the people that you are paying to employ in this massive bloated beast of an institution that you're going to. Uh, so that there's almost a, w a wealth transfer from 18 or 19 year olds that are at the beginning of their, uh, uh, their economic life and are not in the best financial position to people that are mid-career, well-educated, have stable jobs and want bigger budgets so they can build the larger athletics facility or they can build the larger uh, amenity on, uh, on campus that they can put their name on a building or something like that. So. Uh, uh, Really bringing in, reigning and controlling the cost, I, th I think, is the biggest uh, economic and moral issue that's probably facing higher ed right now. Well, what, uh, Phil, everything Phil said is, of course, perfectly right. However, why have costs go up so much? Why was it that before 1950, costs of higher ed were rising 1% a year, maybe more than the rate of inflation, uh, whereas... Uh, incomes were going up 2% a year more than inflation. Hence, incomes were going up faster than costs. College was becoming more affordable rather than less affordable. Why was it that in 1970 even, which is about as late as I want to go with this, uh, with this example, more than 10% of the American population already had college degrees, uh, whereas in 1670, very few did. Uh, why? Well, what happened after 1970 or 1980 is all of a sudden prices started going up, again, West Virginia PowerPoint, 3% <laughs> a year more than the rate of inflation, whereas incomes were now actually only going up about 1% a year more in inflation because we screwed up a lot of other things. But so now college was becoming less affordable rather than more affordable. What happened in the between? Well, uh, being at the Cato Institute and even more importantly, being in this building, in this place, <laughs> with a gang of 535 nearby, uh, we are uh, half, we're right in the center of where the problem is. We are right at the epicenter of the problem. The epicenter of the problem is here. Within one mile of where we are sitting today, all of these problems happened. I guess it takes it in the White House too, does it? <laughs> uh, and so it was, to just pick one aspect of this, the student loan programs. Bill Bennett said in 1987, he was absolutely right. Phil alluded to this, and, 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 and uh, as did Neil. Uh, we uh, said in the New York Times of all places, when the New York Times is a newspaper, uh, <laughs> that, that he said that, well, the government is giving all this money out to peak kids, and what are the schools doing? They're just raising their fees. And since then, the New York Federal Reserve, the uh, uh, National Bureau of Economic Research, Many, many people have come up with empirical evidence, as, as one of you said before, that most, not all, but most of those extra dollars floating out of this place uh, to the kids 
have gone to the form of higher costs at higher ed. The schools have raised the prices, and now I take two vacations a year instead of one, and, and instead of going to the Ozarks or some hick place for a few days, I go to Europe, you know, on the Riviera for two weeks, and it's lovely. The rent seeking is great, but that's what's happened. That's what's happened. So a lot of the problem is here. And so the solutions have, have got to be to downplay the role of the federal government. Now, that's not the whole story. There, you know, we haven't talked about intercollegiate athletics much. And there's a whole bunch of problems. My book is filled with 400 pages of story after story. And I'll, so I'll stop there. Although I want to agree, this goes back to Phil's earlier point. I wrote a column the other day that made my university president very angry. Uh, for I wrote this for Forbes. I said, would you buy a used car from a university president? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll stop there. Uh, well, I'll start by saying the same thing as Rich, which I agree, obviously, with the point of everything Phil and, and Rich said, right, about the cost being the, the issue but more precisely the cost versus the benefit, right? Um, and costs keep going up and up and up, but where, where is it going? And it's pretty clear it's going to bread and circuses, right? Um, <clears throat> as we talk about in the book, the, the amount of money going into the classroom is not going up. Um, if, if it's basically staying the same, even as costs go up. Uh, um, Tenured faculty, as, as Rich said, we, we've got it great, right? We've basically created a medieval guild uh, where we get paid more and more and work less and less uh, than we ever have before. So it really is a great racket. Uh, and, um, and so how do they balance the budget? They basically replace a bunch of us, and I think Phil will disagree with this a little bit, but, uh, but they replace a bunch of us with, uh, with um, uh, adjuncts, right? Uh, you know, sort of temporary faculty and that sort of thing, um, but uh, which is seen, is, which is what the data looks like to me, and I know Phil's written some on that. But that's basically how, how do you how do you keep this thing going? Is basically that, right? Uh, uh, and so, where's all the money going? It's going to administrators, right? Um, you know, the way it, it, it appears to me that one administrator does work, two administrators hold a meeting and hire a third person to actually do the work. Uh, you know, it's like the old joke about one lawyer in a town will uh, uh, starve, two lawyers in a town will thrive, right? Uh, so it's going to administrators, it's going to all these amenities. Colleges and universities do a lot of things that are just bewildering, right? I mean, why do, re why do universities own so much real estate, for example? Um, why, why, why does every university have to have a football stadium, right? Uh, why can't they just use, you know, the high school? I mean, you can imagine all these things, right? They own all these buildings, right? If you compare it to, say, for-profit colleges, right, they rent space, they expand, they contract. Universities have all these fixed capital investments that are, uh, that are caused by distortions, right? The underlying problem, as Rich said, is the, the federal money, right? Why can the money be funneled off to non-academic purposes? It's because it's not your money. It's not, the, it's not really the people paying the money. It's subsidized. It's subsidized loans. It's all this sort of stuff, right? And so they compete on these amenities uh, uh, like they have. And that then creates the whole problem, right, which is we've effectively managed to roughly recreate the healthcare system, system basically predicated on third-party payer, where people are insulated from the real cost of uh, what they are what they're doing by a series of subsidies, the money here gets funneled off into all these other uh, other sorts of uh, sorts of things, and then the government has to come in the back end because there's no incentives for people to pay attention because it's not their money, and the government layers these all these regulations on top of it to make sure the money's being spent properly, which in turn then drives a whole other bureaucracy uh, and compliance costs and, and everything else. But that's the fund that's the original sin, right? When we went from people basically paying for universities, paying for education with their own money to a heavy subsidized system that's essentially third-party payer, you get a whole train of uh, consequences, accreditation, where the money goes, and then regulation on the back end. So, yes, yeah, what the root cause is, and I think that is, uh, that's basically it. All right, I'm going to go to a quick lightning round for you guys, and then I'm going to open it up to the, to the audience. Um, uh, so, quick question. We've talked a lot about what is sort of problematic with higher education. What's good in higher ed? Is there something that should be preserved? What does higher ed do well that we should be appreciative of? 
I hope I didn't stump anybody with yeah. that. That's a hard one. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's the lightning round. Well, you know, I been, you know, I do think, I I teach partly because of the money and the fact that it's such an easy thing to do. And at my age, I'm 78 years old, and it's, it's a piece of cake. I mean, you know, it takes 10% of my time to do what I have to do. I teach three-hour course. I, I'm in class three hours a week and an hour prepare, 30 minutes preparing for it. Uh, so, but the other thing is, I will say this. I do think we do a lot for young people. That's positive. Some of us do, and, and not all the time, and not for all young people. But a lot of people leave college better off than when they came. And I, I think we have to acknowledge that. Now, do we do it efficiently? No. Could we do it a lot better? Yes. Are we student-oriented enough? No. There are a lot of things wrong, but I you, one of you, uh, this fellow mentioned a guy named Josh Hall a minute ago. Josh Hall was my student. He, he is what he is because of me. Not because of Todd. Not because of Todd, but because of me. And he is now a professor of economics. He's the chair of the economics department at West Virginia University. So you do occasionally get home runs when you're a professor. And it makes you feel good. And so I... I I have to say something good, uh, you know, why not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, uh, one other thing that I'd say that is good about the university, at least in its ideal form, is a cultivator of scholarship, a uh, curator of knowledge. We all think of universities as a place where people go to do research and uh, go to investigate uh, uh, challenges or problems that they encounter. Go, they go to study items of culture. And I think there is some underlying truth to that. That's what motivates most people that go into the uh, professorship. That's what motivates people that seek out careers is they really like and they care about ideals. Uh, they, they care about uh, the cultivation of a very narrow subject area, and that could be anything from the history of the United States to uh, uh, classic literature to scientific advancement. Uh, so that, that there, there is a social place for that. Uh, universities do serve a function, I think, in, in, in the sense that uh, uh, they're a, a place where someone can make a career out of studying ideas. Uh, do we do that well? Are there problems with it? Absolutely. Just look across uh, the landscape of higher ed. You see year after year after year, there's a major historian or philosopher who's caught uh, plagiarizing a large segment of his or her book. And these are people that are teaching at Ivy League institutions, the top of the profession. Uh, you see examples of cheating. You see examples of uh, scholarly misconduct. You also see an overinvestment in, uh, in topic areas that uh, you know, most of us would regard as, as very frivolous or niche uh, uh, topics to investigate. So uh, why are we not teaching uh, uh, maybe core text, uh, philosophical uh, canon, or why are we not teaching uh, basics of American history, but we are devoting entire seminars and classes to uh, a very narrow subject area that just so happens to be the, uh, the same topic the professor is writing a book on. I think there's a misallocation of resources there that does take place. So uh, while it's not a perfect system in the, in the sense that uh, there's a lot of waste attached to it, uh, the notion that universities can be a curator of an idea is, uh, is something that I think we should still value. <clears throat> So I th one of the things you probably picked up from the three of us is how passionate we are and how, let's say, irritated uh, we are about what it is. Right? I was going to say something else, but uh, uh, and, and, and why is that? And I think it's because all of us see how important this institution is and how profoundly important it can be to people's lives, right? I was the first one in my family to graduate from college. Um, I don't I don't know what Rich's background is, but uh, but there's a lot of us who feel passionately about this because you know changed my life, right? Um, and and so to to see institutions with so much resources, so much potential, and so important, uh, so much importance, not only doing so little, but in many ways being you know affirmatively pernicious uh, in uh, how they they are behaving is really, that's why we get so annoyed up here, right? Because uh, we really care about this, right? And universities are at the heart of, of 
of the of society, right? Which is universities basically should do three things, right? They should train, and I believe in the principle and the the promise of a liberal, a truly liberal education, right? Universities should train citizens of a free and democratic society, right? We all know that we have to have an educated, informed citizenry that understands the, the country's history and how the government works and that sort of thing, right? In a in a profound way, right? The, uh, the universities can give us a full, meaningful philosophy of life where we can encounter great works and sort of uh, think and talk and, and, and introspect and kind of develop a philosophy of uh, life that we have. And third, universities can, uh, um, in theory, provide human capital skills, right? The way things stand today, and I think a lot of it is because of the way the universities now have been forced to, uh, to justify their existence on utilitarian grounds in order to keep the gusher of funds coming, is they justify purely on the basis of, uh, human, of, of human capital, really. And if that's what you were doing, you would not train people to be, to, for, the, for the job market the way we train people in universities, right? It makes no sense. It makes no sense to go off for four years and study history and German and uh, philosophy and go to football games, right? That's not how you would train. If that's all universities were doing, then, then we're out to lunch, right? The real reasons we have universities are for the other two. The reason we subsidize universities is because human capital, people will invest in that. People will not necessarily invest in the public goods associated with being better people and uh, better citizens. And to some extent, universities still do that, that people still go to college and they can have an experience. They can have the kind of experience I had where kind of the world opened up to me uh, and I could under, you know, learn this sort of stuff. And so it still does have that ability to inspire and educate uh, uh, in a big way uh, 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 people. And so, uh, and so I think we should acknowledge that. Great. So the second part of the lightning round, I'll need a little more lightning on this so that, so that we can get everybody in here. But the Higher Education Act, as many of you probably know, is overdue for reauthorization. Um, there's a concerted effort to try and get it done in the next, uh, well, before this session of Congress is over. I was wondering if you could share maybe one thing that you think is politically realistic that could be done in the Higher Education Act to really improve things. And then maybe something politically unrealistic, which you really think should happen, but does not have a whole lot of chance of, of passing. Anybody want to go first on that one? Rich? Uh, well, some of these little things like it, it may be done outside of the, the act I was reading today and inside higher ed or something. Uh, it, the, the FAFSA form is incredibly st stupid. And <laughs> no one... No one, Democrat, Republican, vegetarian, Presbyterian, whatever your orientation uh, is, agrees that it makes any sense at all, except for a few bureaucrats. I sat in a meeting for six hours in the Secretary of Education's office in the year 2007 to revise this 108-question form. Here, fast forward 11 years. It's now 120 questions. It's gotten longer rather than shorter. That's going to happen. Uh, skin in the game has a 50 percent, a, a 30, 40, 50 percent chance because that's not Republican. It's not Democrat. Uh, we think skin in the game is going to happen some way or other. Not. I don't think it's going to happen all the way because there's going to be loser, big losers in school in the game that are politically very sensitive, including HBCUs. So just lay it right out on the, in the right out. So if I were, I'd be very careful with that if I were a politician. So, but it might happen. Uh, uh, we're going to get some uh, uh, the in ISA concept. Uh, I income share agreements should be starting to float up. And that is, maybe you could argue, has nothing to do with the government. And it really should be purely private, but it may need some clarification in terms of, of, of the sanctity of contracts that, uh, he's a lawyer, uh, that uh, ISA agreements can be enforced uh, in, in, under the law. These are kind of things where I think maybe some agreement can be made. Uh, 
we, we should do, the, the thing won't happen, we ought to do away with the federal student loan program, period. I mean, we should do it in a transitional form over five years. For immediately, though, get rid of PLUS loans for uh, parents, um, uh, get rid of uh, loans for uh, grad students who've been going to, on the, working on their PhD in English for the 14th year, uh, and who are going to go out and get a job at the College of Last Resort as a part-time adjunct. Uh, I mean, this is insane. Why do we do this? It's just crazy. All right, Phil, you want to go next? Yeah, because one thing that uh, just point out, uh, we all talk about and we're aware of administrative bloat and the uh, the growth of all these non-professor uh, individuals that are working in higher ed and they're, and they're really absorbing resources. They're taking up uh, resources. Well, one of the drivers of administrative bloat uh, among many is uh, regulatory mandates that are attached from uh, uh, to, to federal financing of higher education. And we think of regulatory mandates uh, probably very skeptically. This is something that's expensive to uh, administer and implement. And you're right, but the average administrator sees that as an opportunity. That's an opportunity that I can hire three more people to implement this new uh, mandate that's come down from the federal government. Uh, so a, a more modest reform of the Higher Ed Act would focus on ways that we can start stripping out uh, some of the re regulatory mandates that have uh, uh, aggregated and basically accreted over the past uh, uh, 40 or 50 years of, uh, of legislation and attached uh, measures coming down from the federal government. So I do see that as one way of tackling the cost of higher education, tackling the administrative bloat of higher education, is moving away from top-down uh, regulatory mandates that in turn serve as a pretext to hire more administrators because the cost of that is always passed on not to uh, uh, the institution itself but to the students and to the taxpayers. So I do think that's a, a reasonable approach. Uh, my kind of pie in the sky uh, dream would be a, a, a greater attentiveness in higher ed funding, uh, more generally to the returns on degrees. Uh, one thing that we document in our book, and we provide the statistics there, even though it runs against the standard narrative, is higher ed does tend to overinvest in areas like the humanities. Um, in areas that uh, are culturally productive in one sense, but are not attracting many ma majors. If you look at uh, faculty hiring over the past 20 years, uh, the humanities have grown faster than almost any other sector of the academy other than healthcare. And healthcare has a, uh, a separate pre-professional component to it. But uh, uh, humanities are growing at such a rate that there, in some departments like English, there are two professors for every one major. Uh, if you go to the social sciences and the hard sciences, uh, there are maybe one half of a professor for every major. Uh, so this disparity has, a, has occurred as a result of what we invest in and how we, uh, we basically allocate money to, uh, uh, to areas of higher ed that really are not giving much of return. So I, I'd argue more budgetary discipline in that sense, although that's uh, really kind of running up against a, uh, an entrenched political interest. So I'll, I won't necessarily anything to specific be, uh, because the one thing we should know about higher ed is th this whole industry is defined by unintended consequences. Uh, that the, this entire problem is all unintended consequences of well-intentioned ideas that seem like a uh, seem like a good idea, right? What you have to understand, no matter what you do, you're creating a set of incentives. And if you want to kind of think about how higher ed will respond, kind of put on the cap of the, the kind of the most, I think the most sociopathic Wall Street investment banker who cares only about money. That's how universities are going to respond to whatever incentives are created here, right? Uh, at least that's what, what it looks like, right? And so, so we need to think about that, right? And so <clears throat> let's take student loans, for example. Um, so one point on student loans and a larger point, right? Skin in the game. Skin in the game will have unintended consequences. What those unintended consequences are is what predicts student loan default rates is not what you major in or anything like that. What predicts it is your demographics. If you're from a low-income background, if you're self-employed when you go to school, if you're working when you're in school, if you're a minority, uh, um, if you're male, right? That's what predicts uh, student loan default, not what you major in. Student loan default rates, for example, are inversely proportional to how much you borrow. So the higher, the more you borrow, the less likely you are to default, right? Why? Because the ones who default are people who go to three semesters at Directional State University, don't get a degree, and don't get any wage premium from having gone to college, but they end up with debt, 
right? How will colleges respond to skin in the game? I will tell you right now what they will do is they will stop admitting low-income students. They will stop admitting uh, self-employed students. They will stop, uh, you know, right? Which is that's the incentives you are creating, right? So what is the more general point? The more general point is, is to, to build on something Rich says, the, the student loan program, it's a misnomer to call it a loan program. This is no longer a loan program. It's a social welfare program. The latest data are that 37% of people with student loans are actually current and paying down their student loans. The other 63% are either default or delinquent, paying only the uh, uh, interest, or their balances are actually increasing because they're in an income-based repayment plan and they're not even paying the interest. When 37% of people are paying, uh, are, are paying off their loans, that makes the subprime mortgage market looks like a great investment, right? We have basically created a social welfare program. We call it a loan program. And, it, but, and, and so number one, number two, if what we're really concerned about is trying to treat as a loan program and we do things like skin in the game and the impact is going to be basically to end up causing students who we most want to subsidize not to be able to go to school because people won't take low-income students anymore, right? We, we really need to think, I think, about whether we want our student loan program to be a social welfare program or a loan program. We wouldn't design it the way we design it today, regardless of whether we call it a loan program or a, uh, depending on how we answer that question, we would have to redesign the whole student loan program. All right. That brings us to now what we'll call the CQ&A section, comment, question, and answer. Um, what I'll do is raise your hand if you want to comment, question. Uh, they'll do answering, unless you want to respond to what somebody else said. Uh, we have, I think, a microphone here, so I'll call on you and just wait for the microphone to arrive. And the first hand I saw was that uh, man right in the back. And I'll try and go from uh, my right to my left. Um, hi, uh, Rob Tester with Congressman Hank Johnson's office. Um, brief comment. Um, I had the ability to study at Oxford this last spring. I spent a term there, and I found it to be the most fulfilling and exciting educational experience I've had in my four years of college. And so I guess, and I've heard similar things from other people that have studied abroad, especially in Europe. And I was sort of wondering what you think, like lessons that can be learned or that we could bring here maybe from European and other Western educational uh, systems. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, Rich, you go ahead, then we'll go to Phil. And we'll reverse it next time there's a problem. Yeah, I, I, I teach every summer in uh, the Czech Republic at, at the Severo Institute. Uh, and I, I've been doing that on my honeymoon. I took 43 students with me to Italy <laughs> 51 years ago. I have been into this study abroad thing for a long time. It's a cool idea. I agree with you. But the interesting thing was I taught at a purely private school in the Czech Republic. The annual tuition was under $10,000 a year. That was the total cost of the institution. This is in a master's program, a PPE program, politics, philosophy, and economics. And it was high quality. I, while I was over there, uh, Pete Betke, one of your colleagues, was teaching with there uh, uh, down at Duke. Uh, Mike Munger. These are giants in the field. They come over there and teach for nothing. I was teaching for nothing, you know, beer. Uh, <laughs> and, and so there's a lot to be learned. The cost of higher ed in the U.S. is dramatically higher per student than in in other countries in the world, as a general rule. But, but, you know, we have athletics. Who in the hell has ball throwing as part of the curriculum? Only the Americans. We, you think about it. It's crazy. All right, Phil, go ahead. Yeah, to echo that, uh, one thing you see in the European system is it is a lot more bare bones and focused on the educational delivery. There are fewer frivolous uh, perks. There's less of a college lifestyle environment on campus and more of a focus on learning. One other component of that is the curriculum. Uh, and that this is, it varies from uh, university to university in, in Europe, but uh, degrees tend to be completed at a much faster rate over there. 
uh, something that may take four to five years in the United States. An equivalent degree could be done in two and a half to three years. And one of the reasons for that is the gen ed curriculum that we have very rigidly standardized in the U.S. And this comes out of accreditation, as Todd mission, uh, comes out of some other of the other incentives of the university system. But think back to when you were in college. Uh, how many classes did you take that you uh, completely blew off or you don't even remember what they were teaching? Uh, but you took it because you had to check that little box to get your degree. Maybe you wanted to major in political science, but you couldn't start taking your political science classes until you finished uh, two semesters of philosophy, one semester of astronomy, and six semesters of uh, creative writing and composition. Well, uh, one of the, one of the uh, statistical finds that we do in our book that we look at, the, ma the, uh, the departments that have the, the most trouble attracting majors uh, supplement that problem by lobbying to get themselves added to the gen ed curriculum. So if you go back to 1970, the average uh, student in the United States took one semester of writing composition. Today, it's between two to three semesters. What's changed in that time? Uh, the curriculum for writing composition hasn't gotten any more uh, fundamental or better, but uh, the requirements have doubled or in some cases even tripled. Well, what, what that's doing is it's eating up the first one to two years of your college experience on all of these other uh, uh, classes that are not connected to your degree in ways that the European system is much more streamlined, where you get uh, straight into what you want to study as soon as you get there. And one of the downsides of this is you're in the United States, you're actually paying for those extra classes. You're paying for things that you don't uh, really care about and you probably aren't getting uh, much out of. Uh, you know, I'm not deprecating writing skill or, uh, or general scientific knowledge or, or or any value in studying these things, but there is evidence that uh, most students actually forget what's taught in their gen ed classes. Uh, so they do uh, studies of, uh, of writing skills before you start that first semester, and then after you finish the third or fourth semester that's been required of you, and there's no change for most students. So what we're really doing is just diverting tuition into frivolous and extra classes that prolong the college experience and uh, uh, increase the cost to students here in the United States. So in a sense, we can learn a lot from the, uh, the European system in figuring ways to streamline that and getting it condensed down to a shorter period of time that doesn't cost as much. Okay, I'm going to go over to this side, um, and uh, well, I guess we'll stick with the back since that's the first hand I saw go up, so that man over there, way in the back, there you go, and then we're going to go to this side next. Uh, I just want to kind of put a contrary point to the uh, point, comment that was said uh, last question. I think American education is extremely well valued in the globe. And certainly, American educations have high demand uh, across the globe, and I know this because I live half of my life in foreign countries. It is very well respected. I mean, a lot of people understand American education is to be the top tier of the global higher education. So don't you think maybe there is something that American educations are doing right compared to the globe, and maybe that does justify the high cost? Uh, my second question is, uh, so we talk a lot about the problem, the federal loan program, but so is the solution just remove the program? I, I'm going to argue with myself <laughs> and, and, and with you in a favorable way. One thing Americans do better than the Europeans, I think, uh, and, and many others in the world, is for all of our craziness, we do have several thousand different universities. We have several different ways of doing education. We have a nation that has schools like uh, Hillsdale College, which is altogether different, uh, or Liberty University, or uh, dare I say, the University of California, Berkeley. Now those three schools are, are, are the fact that they're on the same planet is a miracle. Uh, the fact that they're part of the same nation is something. And one thing America is good at, you do have a lot of choice in America. And there is something to be said for that. So I sort of part way agree with you. Anybody? I'll just okay. say, uh, I pointed out the problems with the student loan system, and I don't know the solution. Uh, what I do know, though, is that we need to decide whether we want it to be a social welfare program or actually a loan program, and then design it accordingly, where right now it's, it's neither, and it does both poorly. Okay, I'm going over this side, and we'll hit this lady right here. There we go. Thanks, uh, Eliza Stein, Congressman Amash's office. Uh, 
I'm curious whether you all think there's been various discussion about the relationship of college degrees to getting jobs and high paying jobs. I'm curious to what extent you all think that specific skills learned in college nowadays are useful for uh, finding well paying jobs and to what extent it's signaling. And I guess the second part of that is what does the, the combination of skills and social signaling mean for the growth of free college programs? Uh, does more affordability just postpone the problem to grad school? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think there's, uh, there's an interesting issue at play here. Uh, one thing we find, if we look at statistics of um, you know, post-employment salary for a bachelor's degree, uh, there are certain fiel fields that do uh, have st higher starting salaries than others, and they're exactly what you'd expect. The STEM fields, uh, so math, sciences, anything in the, uh, the physical sciences, and then some um, areas of social science, like economics, do have really high starting salaries. And then on the other end of that, uh, you have French poetry or uh, a lot of the humanities, English, uh, some areas of history, much lower starting salaries. But what you do see across the board is a bachelor's degree, a standard BA or BS, is uh, a pretty fungible degree to most entry-level jobs, where you do really start to see uh, some of the crunch of overinvestment in what we would call uh, uh, you know, potentially frivolous areas of study, frivolous skills, is at the grad school level. Uh, you have departments that are generating uh, dozens upon dozens of PhDs, new PhDs, in that French uh, poetry uh, degree or in English literature or in really obscurantist areas of study that there simply are not many jobs for outside of the academy. And if you look at the academic job market, it's all glutted. Uh, you have two or three hundred applicants for a single position in an English department or a history department or a philosophy department over and over again, and most of those applicants have no, uh, not only no interest in getting a job outside of the academy, but they don't really have a degree that's, uh, that's fungible in the same way that a, um, a standard bachelor's degree would be. Uh, so that's where some of the overinvestment comes in. But you also see an incentive here. Uh, if you're a faculty member and you teach in a philosophy program, a history program, an English program, it's a prestige thing for you to have PhD students under you. It's, uh, it's something that elevates the value of what you're offering. So you get uh, faculty and also administrators to raise the prestige of their institution. They lobby to keep very inefficient programs around that are generating too many degrees but not enough uh, uh, jobs to, uh, to actually place those students. And that's where we get the, uh, uh, the, the, the real crisis of uh, overinvestment in certain areas that don't really have much return in the academy. Before, Rich, before you go, I just want to say as a former uh, English major, I find this whole conversation <laughs> insulting. Um, but anyway, go ahead, Rich. Well, and I was going to say, the best courses I had in college was the year I studied French literature, who was talking about novels. And to this day, I think very highly of that, those courses. And damn it, I still, you know, every now and then I count to 10 in French just to show that I can. I, I, uh, I do uh, that in English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but there, uh, on a more s somewhat serious note, uh, the, if you believe the Federal Reserve Bank of New York data, 40% of students are under, of 40% of college graduates, recent college graduates, are underemployed, doing jobs that could be filled by high school grads and so forth. Uh, and there are differences in, in earnings by majors. But, but to me, it's, it seems like it would be the worst thing that could happen would be for the Congress of the United States to say which majors are important and which are not. Uh, because first of all, aside from the fact that they couldn't do it very well, th that changes from year to year and, and, and so forth. Petroleum engineers at some time are extremely high paid. Five years later, when the price of oil is $30 a barrel, <laughs> They're very low pay. The pay's going to go up big, by the way, if the uh, Iranians keep bombing the Saudi thing. It's a good time to go into petroleum engineering. But uh, so uh, it seems to me we're over-invested in higher ed, and we shouldn't try to pick winners and losers. It's a signaling device anyway, most of it. Most kids that go to college are not... My God, three-fourths of kids that go to college learn very little in college that is directly used on the job. I'll just uh, 
say say two quick things. I think first it is it has to be mainly signaling, right? Uh, the ability to get in and graduate, right? One of the funny things about these college bribery scandals is all these idiot showbiz kids did perfectly fine in college, right? Uh, which shows apparently it's pretty easy to get through just about any college in the United States, uh, even if you spend all your time in Instagram and aren't very smart to begin with, uh, which suggests that there's something about the signaling of getting in, right, uh, uh, to, to, and, uh, to some extent. Second thing is a, a, a larger point, and we could have a whole panel just on this, is I've not seen a compelling explanation of credential creep. Uh, there are various hypotheses as to why uh, credential creep, why so many people go to college, and now why so many people go to graduate school, right, um, in the overemployment thing. Something's going on, um, and I think that, that it would if we could try to figure out what is driving this overinvestment in people getting degrees that they don't seem to need, it's obviously some sort of signaling game of, I got it. everybody else has a bachelor, so I have to have a master's, so you know, in in, the, in that sort of thing. But I don't really know what the underlying driving dynamic of that is. But uh, but I think that would be a big question to uh, to answer. All right. So our next question is this gentleman right over here. Then I'm going back to this oh, side. Thank you. First, a quick comment. The situation you've been talking about was described and explained very well in chapter three of book five of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations in 1776. Things have not changed. <laughs> but my question uh, is, uh, colleges were first created, uh, first to train clergy, but then to train the children of wealthy f families who would never have to work at all. If somebody wanted a career, they'd get an apprenticed or they'd go to a trade school or something. Colleges today have become basically trade schools. Does it make sense, I mean, college is not for everyone, does it make sense to invest and tell people you gotta go to college or should we be bringing back trade schools and apprenticeships? Who's gonna take it? I think we should be bringing, at least making it more available. God, no, I hate the Pell, I hate all federal programs, but if you're going to have federal programs, why don't you let kids go to a, a trade school? Why don't you let them go to a coding academy uh, where they can learn to, I mean, if that's what you, the thing is supposed to be, we're supposed to be teaching people skills. Let them go to a coding academy. Six months, they learn how to code, whatever that means. I don't even know what it means. But uh, learn how to code. And, uh, and, and, and by the way, some of them are free. You go free, and, and it's an income share agreement. At the end of the program, you uh, uh, give the uh, uh, college 15% of your money for three years. Uh, why don't we do more of that kind of stuff? I agree with you. You're absolutely right. I've been conning the uh, students and taxpayers of my state for 50-some years with this notion that college is for all. It's, it's completely bunk, and I, I can say so now that I am about ready to hit the grave. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny you, you raise that because that's exactly the point Henry Manny made in his first essay that led us to do all this, which he said there used to be basically two types of schools. There were trade schools where basically people paid their own way, and there were schools that prepared people for the clergy where the trustees basically – ran the university, set the curriculum, hired and fired. Over time, we got this model of university governance that we, like most bad ideas during the uh, 19th century, we borrowed from Germany. Um, uh, so, um, uh, but the irony, what, what the great irony of this is, I think most people think we should have more, if we're gonna train for skills, let's train for skills, rather than sending poor, some poor kid who uh, want, you know shouldn't be at a four-year university into this system that, they don't understand the point, right? They should be doing something that will actually train them. That's the irony of the attack on the for-profit colleges, right? That's what for-profit colleges have done for, for, for 200 years, right, uh, was uh, that they train for skills. Um, and, uh, um, and so, you know, and so I think that kind of model is the traditional model of delivering skills-based education from nursing to, uh, to air conditioning repair, right? 
Yeah, just to echo on that point, I'm glad you brought up Adam Smith. For those that aren't familiar with it, Adam Smith basically proposed, or actually observed, that in the Scottish uh, university system at the time, there was a direct connection between what the students would pay for and the classes that they took. They paid a, a, a supplemental fee to the professors they liked and the subject areas they wanted to study. Uh, what we've seen in the, uh, the 200, 250 years that have emerged since then is there's a, um, a, a separation between the actual payment that the student makes and the provision of the degree. In a sense, universities have become uh, much like healthcare. There's a third party uh, payer system that's emerge through loans, whether it's uh, it's indirect in the sense that you're taking out money from somebody else, whether it's subsidized by the government, whether it's through scholarship. So there's no longer a connection between what the student actually wants or desires or values that they could vote with their feet on uh, and what's actually being provided. Throw in gen ed requirements on top of that, where everyone's in this very uniform, formulaic uh, curriculum that they have to complete over a minimum of a four-year period in order to get a bachelor's degree. And uh, we, we've actually completely lost any signaling mechanism of what the students want, uh, what, uh, what job, uh, what employers are actually seeking to hire. Uh, from the, uh, the the degree that's actually being delivered there. So uh, really anything that can cut away at some of the uh, rigid gen ed curriculum requirements, can, can cut away at this third party payer system, can restore something of a market mechanism into uh, the provision of degrees that are being offered. Real quick, where you go? Yeah, it is real quick. Adam Smith, 1776. In the University of Oxford, the greater part of the public professors have for all, for these many years, given up altogether the pretense of teaching. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the Higher Ed Act was going to fix all these things. Okay, so I think we have time for probably two more questions. It'll be kind of fast, actually, or comments in the CQ&A period. So I'm going to go to this lady right here in the purple dress, and then I'm going to go back over there if there's a question there, and then I think we'll probably be done. Good afternoon. My name is Valerie Austin. I'm actually an author of the Student's Comprehensive Guide for College and Other Life Lessons. It's a career and college readiness book for high school students and their parents. My question basically is, how can parents and students become better consu consumers when selecting universities and college? There are three speakers there, so what are three practical things they should look at and pay particular, to, pay particular attention to when they're selecting? Strictly practical advice, I'd urge uh, you know, parents to look to see what AP credits will transfer in, uh, what other forms and mechanisms that you can knock out some of these gen ed requirements at a, at a uh, much cheaper rate. Can you transfer in uh, credits from a uh, community college that are a third or a fourth of the tuition that the uh, university you're looking to go to offers? Uh, what are some of the other curricular requirements? Are you going to be getting right into your major and taking the classes that, that you want to prepare you for the career that you're interested in? Or are they requiring you to take two or three years worth of uh, uh, frivolous other stuff? Um, also, Look on campus, what are they spending money on? Uh, are they investing uh, very closely in the delivery of the educational product, or are you taking on a tour where you're shown every top-notch facility uh, that has rock climbing walls, lazy rivers, all these other things that are described, the best athletic facility, but they're not really focusing on, uh, on what's actually occurring in the classroom? Because that's normally a sign that they're trying to sell you the lifestyle of that university and the experience of that university rather than the, than the educational product you're trying to get out of it. Yeah, you may have noticed I'm not a, 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 a big fan of new uh, federal laws, but I think I would tentatively support a federal law that banned any campus tours uh, when students uh, visited a college uh, for the reasons Phil was saying, which is they show you the, the climbing wall and the lazy river and the bells and the, you know, the bread and circuses experience of, uh, of college, which is what the student, the kid wants it to be about, right? But the parent, um, I think the one tangible advice I would have would be to try to focus on, try to focus the kid on what actually matters, uh, which is what are they going to learn uh, while they're there? It's hard to compete on price. I think you know Phil said some things at the margin, transferring credits and that sort of credits and that sort of thing. But we basically have a cartel system uh, enforced by the creditors, where basically everybody charges more or less the same price. Um, and so I think what you could really do for your kid is try to have them focus on why they're going to college, and that then is focusing on you know what classes are taken, who's teaching them, what are the class sizes going to be, how easy. One of the things that a lot of people have found out now is 
There's a lot of classes in the, uh, in the uh, catalog, and it's really hard to get the classes you actually want. Uh, you know, uh, and so how often are important classes um, uh, um, offered? How quickly do people graduate? You know, those sorts of things. Uh, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing because it needs to be done. Uh, the, there's a big mismatch between what kids know and think about colleges and what their capabilities are, and there are also differences between people. The best school for person A is not the best school for person B. So we need to, to uh, bring that information out. The federal government, I keep complaining about the federal government, I guess I'll continue. Uh, uh, the, college, the Department of Education, which I wish had never come to pass, but it's here, could at least give us all, they have all every kind of data. They can tell you how many left-handed Hispanic professors there are of anthropology there are in the state of North Dakota, <laughs> if they wanted to. But will they tell you what percentage of the kids go to this college or that college, graduate in time, what percentage borrow, and so forth? They're, they've started to put that data on with the college scoreboard and the college indicators, but there is a lot more that could be done than is being done. and. Uh, and I rank, I'd rank colleges and universities for Forbes magazine for 10 years. So I am a, I'm one of those guilty rankers uh, out there. Uh, but, you know, you can say all your mouth about the rankings. The people, re reason people looked at them is no one else was giving them any good information. And it's good to see that you're doing that. Okay, so we got time for one last question. We're going to go to the lady in the jacket right there. Keep your hand up so the, there we go, so the guy with the microphone can find you. We're going to be real quick with this. Hello, my name is Amber Moore from Chiefs for Change. Uh, my question is, so if you adopt a for-profit deregulated model like you were suggesting, how would you, protect, or how would you protect students, specifically first-generation students, in the college choice process, just like the woman over there asked? And how would you encourage for-profit colleges not to build larger rock walls and lazy rivers to then attract more students. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the difficulties, of course, is that the subsidies are riven through the whole system, right? Uh, that applies to, uh, to, uh, to everybody, for-profits, non-profits. Um, um, and, and so, and so you know, and, and for-profits just simply look different from non-profits, right? So one of the chapters we have in the book is David Hyman looks at the only other industry I could think of where for-profits and non-profits compete with each other, and that is um, uh, hospitals, right, and medical care. And basically what he finds is so-called non-profit hospitals and for-profit hospitals basically operate exactly the same. Right, they do the same amount of pro bono work. Nonprofit hospitals just have nicer lobbies uh, because they can't pay out their surplus to stockholders. They just plow it back in in bells and whistles, the same way universities um, uh, do. Right. So I think to start off with the idea that somehow there's a distinction between for profit and nonprofit that's not true in healthcare and that doesn't seem to be true in, uh, in in universities either, right? They all just gobble up every uh, bit of money uh, that, that they can get. And so then I think it's really just a matter of recognizing why we might have different models in these. Um, and for-profits basically are an accountability-based model where they're based on whether or not the programs they offer to the kids end up passing their licensing test or becoming an electrician or whatever the case is at the at the end um, and getting their 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 kids jobs and so um, and so I think that there's we should just think of it is um, that I don't see that there's any particular you know differences um, in thinking about how we think about competition simply because of the the business models uh, that they have and then it's just a matter of providing information like uh, people are saying so one of the things I'll just say on, on that point we have a chapter on this is one thing that you guys could think about is what a disgrace the community college system is uh, in, in the country. Community colleges are the darlings of everybody, but community colleges are a disaster, right? They're basically doing, I don't know what they're doing, some sort of skills-based training, but based on a model that kind of reflects you know, four-year college systems of faculty governance and that sort of thing, right? And so one of the studies we have in the, the book shows one reason why kids go to for-profit colleges instead of community colleges is literally when they call, the people of the for-profit colleges answer the phone. Literally, they answer the phone. 
They don't answer the phone in a community college. And when they answer the phone at the community college, 80% of the time they don't know the answer and they refer you to the website, right? <laughs> and we're talking about people who don't have the human capital, don't have the time, who often have kids who are going back to school, who have failed in the traditional education system, and we funnel them into this community college system that's modeled more or less on the you know, the, the four-year college system for people with a lot of social capital and the like. And, um, and you know, that's why community, one of the reasons community colleges have terrible completion rates and everything else, right? As I think part of the, uh, the thing here in terms of creating more competitions, we're going to have community colleges. Let's actually make them work, right? Let's allow them to have a model that actually delivers value to their students rather than the model we have now, which is sort of a watered-down sort of, you know, half-hearted um, half effort at a four-year college and a half-hearted effort at a, uh, a for-profit college that basically does career training. All right, Phil and Rich, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I think... Uh, there's a, I've written a lot on for-profit colleges, but I think in the interest of time, I'll, right. I'll just pass. Okay, great. Well, so we are now at the end. I want a few quick messages. One is English majors of the world unite because we don't need to put up with this. Um, I want to thank uh, Senator Scott, who's not here, but it was terrific of him to take some time out to talk to us. I want to thank the panel um, for your books and for everything that you uh, offered here. And I want to thank you all for coming. And there may be still books outside in the hallway. I'm not sure. We had several. There are. I've got the thumbs up. So uh, if you get out there fast enough, there are free books available. Thank you very much.